Well, thank you everybody for coming along tonight uh, to hear my testimony, and especially on such a good evening where I'm sure there's lots of other things we could have been doing. Hey, uh, but the weather is nice, and we're, we're thankful for that. Hey, uh, last week we had uh, Robert Hewitt was speaking with us and preaching, and Robert is uh, been preaching for many years and. Of course, I'm still a novice at this sort of thing, so it's a tough act to follow. But uh, we're telling the same wonderful message of the gospel, and I know that the Lord will be with me uh, all the way, and that people will be praying for me as I just would give my, my testimony. So, as Timmy uh, has said in, in the intro there, my name's Philip Hutchinson, and my testimony began on Friday the 30th of September, 1983 at about 2 a.m. when I was born in Craigavon Area Hospital and into the loving care of Wilmer and Lynn, who most people know here, I imagine, with maybe exception of one or two. And I was the middle of three children, uh, always known as the referee or the peacemaker or the negotiator. A older brother, Robin, younger sister, Avril, always meant for some interesting times. A, but of course, I was completely innocent, always. I've never done anything wrong. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was born into a very loving home. Uh, and between all the refereeing and negotiating, there was a lot of fun to be had between us three. And we never wanted for anything. I wouldn't say we were spoiled uh, by no means, but we definitely had everything we ever needed uh, and more. But more importantly than, than having things and uh, having everything we needed, uh, it was a Christian home, which as a young boy didn't always feel like a blessing. But looking back on it now, of course, I can see how much those early years of mum and dad teaching us prayer and how to pray, teaching us God's word and showing us Christian values had a major role in my life. After hearing the gospel week in, week out, uh, it became clear to me from a young age that uh, I needed to be saved and uh, I needed to ask the Lord Jesus into my heart. And as a young boy, not sure of exact dates or years or anything they got, but if I was put a guess on it, I would say about eight or nine years old. And uh, yes, that, that's about the age I got saved initially and I thought that that would have been me sorted and I continued to be brought to church and I went to Sunday school and came to Bible clubs and EBR and uh, all the other activities that went on here at Woodford and around different churches too but I didn't really progress in my faith and I had no, no zeal and no interest in growing as a Christian. I suppose at that time I just thought to myself well I have done what I needed to. I've asked the Lord into my heart and I'm saved and that's me sorted. I have nothing nothing more to do. Uh, and of course, that's the wrong way to be, to be thinking. What I really should have been doing was praying and reading God's word and uh, every day so that I could be uh, growing and growing closer to God all the time. So I was growing older physically, uh, but certainly not walking with the Lord. And that's when I feel the devil took opportunity to uh, attack and come into my, and my yeah, attack. And First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says that the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it was around that age, maybe 8, 9, 10, 11, probably more 11 and I started to get some strange thoughts and doubts coming into my mind like you know am I really saved is this is this really for real you know it all sounds so unbelievable and far-fetched you know how can how can that be right and I started to doubt if I was ever saved at all and I can remember uh, uh, by some way of trying to get assurance uh, on numerous occasions, uh, asking the Lord to come in to, and save me again. But, uh, of course, this didn't work, and the, the doubts continued. 
Uh, growing up, I was quite shy and nervous, and I suppose if anybody had asked me a question, you'd have you've seen me beaming like a traffic light from a mile off, and I, of course that meant then that I was reluctant to speak to anybody uh, and uh, about the doubts and feelings that I was having, and I just tried to deal with it myself, and by deal, I just, what I mean there is just ignored it, just put it away somewhere. And this was another mistake. What I should have been doing was maybe talking to my parents or hey, somebody at church hey, just that I would have trusted that just how I was feeling and they could have helped me, they could have prayed with me and or brought me to some reassuring scriptures or even better, I, I could and should have been uh, praying to, to the Lord God for help to get me through the trial that I was having. So really this continued for a number of years and then I was in a teenager and I, I started going to City of Arma High School and I made some friends there who were not Christians and I didn't tell them that I was a Christian. I felt ashamed and embarrassed and scared that I might be teased or bullied or whatever so I just kept it to myself which was yet another mistake from a young Christian's point of view. And that left me uh, open for peer pressure to take hold. And then all the things that my school friends were saying and doing, then I was just going along with it as well. All the while, probably still having the, the doubts about was I really saved uh, at all. But I suppose as the years went on, I became less and less concerned. Then by the time I was leaving high school, I had a double image as such. I had an image for my school friends uh, and my peers where I was becoming more and more involved in non-Christian activities. And then there was the other image for mum and dad and for people at church. And this went on for quite a long time. And to my shame, it probably went, uh, it went as far as me getting baptised here in the hall and breaking bread on Sunday morning uh, as if I was walking close to the Lord. When in reality, I, I was far from close. And I knew this was wrong, but I, I had peers at school who I didn't want to tell about church. Uh, and on the other hand, I had family and church friends who I didn't want to disappoint either. So there was deceit going on on all fronts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, by now then I was 16 and I just left high school. And uh, after five years of high school, I was pretty sure that I was definitely not going to go on for further education. And I was more suited to more practical things, and I enjoyed working uh, with my hands. And so I decided getting that a trade would be the right career path for me. Over the summer of the year 2000, I... I thought about this long and hard about which trade I would like to be and I decided that I wanted to be an electrician but when the time came to enroll at the college the electrician course was full and I came home that day and enrolled on the plumber's apprentice scheme a, which so far has worked out and the Lord had his hand in that too because I've really enjoyed my time as a last 22 years as a plumber and a, uh, has allowed me to develop my career and to into other things as well so yeah I've, that is that has worked out well so now that I had left school and I was working and I was out in the real world I, I got my eyes opened a bit I suppose and from a young Christian's point of view then this is by this point when things started to go a south in a big way from, from a Christian point of view. And again, I didn't speak to any of my work colleagues or my friends uh, about Christianity or about my Christian experience and upbringing. And again, peer pressure had, had set in. But of course, uh, now the, the sin was becoming a little bit more serious. At the start, maybe just started out going to the odd Christmas party or the odd event. Same as everybody else, and maybe on the first few occasions, I didn't get too involved because I knew deep down, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have been there. But as time went on, 
I, and I was invited to more and more events, I became more comfortable in that environment. And the deep down feeling gradually became suppressed, but never completely. Before long, then this uh, party scene, so to speak, was um, was every weekend and was the norm. And almost every weekend was excessive drinking, smoking, and occasionally using other substances too. But I, uh, yeah, it, it seemed that that in the double life battle, the non-Christian side of me uh, had won, and I had been. Quite easy picking for the devil and his schemes because I didn't uh, try to resist much in any way. Uh, I heard recently, somebody said at the church here recently, that if you have two dogs and you only feed one dog, which one do you think will prevail? Of course, the dog that you feed the most uh, is going to prevail. And in my case, I neglected my spiritual life from a young age and allowed my mind to be fed and influenced by worldly things, which was the world and the devil prevailed in my life. So re really this was how things were for the next uh, many years, 12 years or so. Uh, attending church had become a thing of the past and by this stage any previous Christian influence had been put firmly to the back of my mind. The odd time, as Timmy said earlier, I would go to a gospel meeting when asked, but this would just be to appease certain people that I didn't want to disappoint. And whatever had been said, I was able to shut it out and forget in a short time. At 18, I moved to England for three years, uh, where I lived and worked in the Lake District. And at 21, I took a working holiday in Australia for a year although it was more holidaying than working, admittedly. And uh, in fact, it was only nine months uh, because in the end I became quite lonely and a bit homesick and I came home uh, slightly earlier at nine months. Then in 2006, at 22 years old, I was back home in Northern Ireland, uh, living at home again for a short time and uh, I got a job with a local plumbing firm in Ochnacloy, which was owned by a believer who would often witness to me, and probably for the first time in a long time, I would open up slightly to him about my Christian upbringing, but never enough really to engage in any, any meaningful conversation. Unfortunately then, there, there was a tragedy in that situation because the owner of that company died in a freak a tractor accident. And the reason I mention that is just because I can remember that incident uh, really affected me because this was probably the first person that I had known uh, quite well. I, yeah, very well, actually, in fact. And he seemed had had died seemingly before his time. And he had left a young family and he had so much to live for. Uh, but I remember his funeral and just being such a sad event. But at the same time, the minister reminded everyone that although we were grieving, uh, he was with the Saviour which in heaven, which is far better than anything here on earth. And I think so far, I've mentioned two or three times maybe that I was able to put Christian thoughts to the back of my mind, uh, but never completely. That still small voice was always there, uh, and I believe that to be the power of prayer. I always knew that my parents and others were uh, here at Woodford, uh, aunts, uncles, friends, so many people were, were praying for me, often. And on many occasions I would have liked to come back to Christ, but I always backed out of it, uh, scared of what my friends might think, my workmates, peers, everybody might, might say, and how could I tell them, and how could I make such a change in my life? So my boss's funeral was one of those moments where that voice was really amplified and really made me think hard about how I was living my life and how I had neglected the Lord Jesus Christ. How this is not how God intended me to live. Uh, but as seems to be the theme of my uh, story so far, I was able to fill my mind with other things and, and move on. 
Saturday the, the 16th of February 2008 is an important date in the calendar. Uh, some friends and I were out on a regular Saturday night in Armagh City Hotel. The bunker, as it was known, uh, when a certain young blonde had caught my attention. And it seemed I had caught her attention also, but for the wrong reasons. Because although I was very interested, uh, I was also still very nervous and shy. And uh, I didn't make much or any effort, to that, for that matter, uh, to make conversation. And just continued to make a uh, conversation with my friends. Now this greatly irritated uh, the young woman in question. And uh, she thought I was the most arrogant person in the room. Uh, but this unintentional, unintentional strategy was a hit. Who knew? Uh, and before the night was out, uh, by ways I don't quite remember, uh, we had agreed to exchange phone numbers. Come to think of it, the conversation was probably instigated by Inga, uh, asking me what, what was my problem. But one thing led to another, and uh, it wasn't long before things became quite serious. And we moved in together, uh, first of all in Armagh, for a few years, and then uh, out in Killalea. But it wasn't smooth sailing, and there were a few breakups along the way. But we always managed to work it out in the end. As a couple, we would be asked to gospel meetings regularly, but we'd only attend sometimes, like before. Uh, the Christian message was new to Inga, and after a couple of years of blatantly being called a sinner, she was offended uh, and couldn't understand why people kept uh, week in, week out, saying to us that we were sinners. So this led to a sort of a strange situation, a weird situation, where although I wasn't living a Christian life, and far from it, I found myself explaining the gospel, a message to Inga, uh, and quoting verses that I had learned as a child, like Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned, and explaining that no matter what, and we were born that way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, now, I was 27, and... Uh, after numerous conversations defending the gospel but not living it, I found myself considering more and more where I might spend eternity. One night in particular, I had been asked to a gospel meeting. The topic on the evening was the second coming of Jesus Christ and how Christians would be taken up to the air to meet the Lord and those not saved will be left behind. Uh, the news headlines on that day would be that millions of people have disappeared with no explanation, explanation uh, and those who are left behind will have no chance of repentance as the opportunity is gone. Now I had heard this message many times before, uh, but the Holy Spirit really spoke to me uh, that winter night of 2011, and I can remember sitting so uncomfortably and holding back tears and with a huge lump in my throat. And I just couldn't wait to get out of the room uh, for the meeting to be over. So as soon as the meeting ended, I, uh, I made a beeline for the exit, as you do. And the speaker met me on the way, which wasn't by accident, I don't think. Uh, and he could clearly see that I was under the spirit. So we went to a quiet place to pray. And I told him my situation that I, I would dearly love to be saved, but I wasn't sure if I could commit uh, to it and he, we prayed again and at the end he said listen it's, it's between you and God you, you know what you have to do it's, it's over to you to, to do what you have to and I really thought that I would get saved that night uh, and I was so distracted by my thoughts uh, that on the way home I nearly had a car accident and nearly drove into the back of somebody uh, but yeah but again Somehow, I don't know how, I, I resisted and, and I didn't. But what happened that night I had left a real impact on me. And I, in the following weeks and months, I started reading the Bible. And I started praying a bit more. And I started mentioning then to Inga that I'm considering getting saved. 
by which stage she also was, was reading along with me and we were being convicted uh, together by the Holy Spirit. Then in March 2012, there was a mission being held in the hall here. And uh, I was coming along to the meetings every night, determined that I wasn't going to miss this opportunity. And on the 1st of March, on the fourth night, I managed to hold on to the fourth night of the mission. I, and after many years of knowing the truth, but willfully resist, resisting it, I finally repented of my sins and I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart a, a second time. And for real this time. <laughs> a, Inga also got saved at the same mission. A, and also my sister-in-law, Gunta. Uh, and some others as well who are, who are here tonight as well and it, it was a real blessed time for the, for the people here at Woodford uh, and for me especially then at work the following day the following days I, I told my work colleagues I told my friends uh, about what had happened and that I got saved and that I'd become a Christian and then they will see some changes in my life and the thing that had put me off for so many years and thinking what would people think and this, that and the other, to my surprise, was not really a big deal at all. Everybody seemed okay and yes, they asked some questions and were a little bemused and didn't quite understand, but it definitely wasn't as big a deal as, as I imagined it. I, yeah, so, and a few months later then I got baptized as is commanded in the scriptures and uh, this was another opportunity for me to bring people in and to publicly show uh, my faith and that my old life was, was dead and I had started a new life in the Lord Jesus. Uh, I think I, I just want to say a few words now on my life since uh, becoming a Christian and getting saved 10 years ago. Uh, at that stage, Inga and I had been together for four years and although uh, there was, as I said, the odd bumpy patch at the beginning. We we did love each other, and uh, we, after getting saved, moved obviously into separate accommodation, and uh, we prayed about our situation and and what what we would do, and uh, the outcome of that was that that we should get married, <laughs> and uh, we did on the twentieth of July, two thousand twelve. Then one year later, uh, our first child, Alex, was born. And uh, two years after that, uh, along came Elise in 2015. Uh, God has blessed us with so many things. Uh, a home that we have built together near Killale, secure jobs, loving family, loving church family. Church is so important for us too. And uh, he has given us opportunities to be a part of the church here and to work and tell others uh, involvement in the in the youth, EBR and EGR, and uh, the list goes on and on with with blessings that the, the Lord has given us, and we, uh, we're, I'm so thankful for Him, uh, saving me. But the best blessing of all is just, and we spoke about this in our in our meeting this morning, is just having the assurance and the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ in my life. Just to know that all my sins, past, present and future, no matter what they are, no matter how much I think of them and how horrible they are in the, uh, in the past, that has all been, the slate has been wiped clean and I have a new start and a new life in Jesus. And I say future as well because uh, the devil has thrown many temptations in my path over the past 10 years uh, to which I have fallen to many and no doubt will fall again. But it's the promise of Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 which says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It just gives me the encouragement that when I fall to temptation or when I do something that I know is sinful, that I can come and repent again and this verse gives me the encouragement to get up, back up again and go on again for the Lord. 
I'll just close now with, with one uh, overarching verse, which uh, I think sort of sums up my testimony. And it's found in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You know, the Lord knocked at my door for many, many years. And I heard it, but I wouldn't let him in. So I'm just glad that, that he did. didn't give up on me. And I, I still had the opportunity, even after years of ignoring him. So, yeah, that's really all I want to say. And thank you all for listening. I'll just, uh, if anybody here is uh, can relate to my story and uh, would like to become a Christian, but for one reason or another uh, is, is putting it off or... I don't know, putting it off for whatever reason. Could I just encourage you not, not to anymore? Because, say, uh, as the verse I've just read, the, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you uh, if you do make that commitment to him. Thank you. I'll hand back over to Timmy here now, I think. Well, again, Philip, thanks very um, much for that. It's not easy to maybe get up here and, first of all, speak to so many, but even to be open and vulnerable about um, your life. But it's just another sign of what the Lord has done and in, in, in his life um, to be able to be convicted to share that. And we, we'll just close in prayer now and, and, and pray that that... Um, that story, that, that true story, and that work that God has done in Philip's life would would mean something to us tonight and this week um, that we can take away. As I said earlier, each of us can maybe take something different from it, but um, we'll just close now and, and bring it before the Lord. Lord, we do just praise you tonight. Lord, that this isn't a, a story that's made up a testimony just for entertainment. But Lord, this is true. Um, and Lord, this is this is life. Lord, this is this is what it's about. This is what this church, this is what Christianity is about, Lord. This is what you are about, Lord. Lord, taking broken lives, Lord, taking lives that are far from you, taking people that aren't interested in you. And most of all, taking sin, Lord, and as your word says, Lord, casting it as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, Philip, tonight thanks you for that. Lord, I tonight thank you for that. Lord, tonight those in the car park that are Christians, Lord, once again, thank you. Lord, that you have taken our sins, past, present, and future, Lord, and you have given us that blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. That blessed assurance that when our time comes, whether it's when we're old and elderly or whether it's like Philip's boss and just in a moment of time that we leave, that we know where we're going. And your word has told us that we should have no doubt because of what you have done. And Lord, as Christians, we rejoice in that, Lord. But our prayer tonight, and our focus tonight, maybe, Lord, is for those that just can't say that. Whether it's similar to Philip, and maybe the knowledge is there, maybe the attendance to church has been there, the family is there. Or maybe it's something like Inga, and the knowledge is new, and it's all strange, and maybe it's even offensive. Lord, in both them cases, you by your spirit can come in and just reveal things that we can't reveal the truth of it and lord you can take them lives and you can change them
And Lord, we pray that for many tonight, Lord. Even in these moments, Lord, many of us can think of people that we pray that over. Lord, we have loved ones. We have people that we deal with every day. And Lord, we would just love to see that, that transformation, that new heart, that new spirit. And Lord, that that's what you can do. Lord, we cannot do it. So Lord, even in these moments, Lord, we lift them people up to you. And Lord, we pray for them. And Lord, we're thankful and encouraged today as we leave here, Lord, that you hear our prayers. You know them, people, Lord. You're interested in them and you love them. And Lord, we pray that you do save them. But Lord, tonight we do go away encouraged of what you've done in Philip's life, Lord, what you've done in Inga's life. And we pray for them, Lord, as a family. Lord, bless them even tonight, Lord, as the devil would be so interested in coming in and discouraging them and discouraging that family and attacking them of what he has done and stood here in faith um, to tell his story. And so, Lord, go with us all, Lord, as we drive home and we head into our weeks. Lord, go with us and bless us, praise in your name. Amen. Well, again, just thank you for coming. And 7 p.m. next week is the Hannah Brothers. And to sing and to testify with us. Thank you very much.